I'm Joan Klagsbrun. I'm a clinical psychologist, and I have a psychotherapy practice in Boston, Massachusetts. And I have a passion to bring focusing to people who are struggling with illness and facing illness and their family members. And so I do this in several ways. About a third of the people in my practice either are facing illness themselves or who have or have family members who are. I also uh, integrate focusing in with cancer support groups that I facilitate. And I um, often offer focusing classes, uh, particularly for people with illness. And then I try and bring focusing to healthcare professionals at every opportunity I can find. Um, physicians, nurses, social workers, psychologists, and chaplains. And I do that by presenting at um, behavioral medicine conferences and by going into hospitals and giving in-service um, conferences. And I usually entitle those workshops or those classes uh, fo focusing a mind-body approach to stress reduction and insight. And I always say it's for the professional themselves as well as a tool they can bring to patients. And I think given the healthcare system, people, you see stress reduction for myself and people come. So. And more recently, I have, um, most recently, have been um, just begun to get engaged in a research study that will look at focusing and the arts in relation to uh, women who are going through a support group with, for breast cancer. And we're hoping to show that in combining focusing in the arts, um, these women have less stress after um, less anxiety, less depression, and a better body image. So it's exciting uh, to begin to actually get some data to show what we all intuitively know, that a focusing attitude and a focusing approach is incredibly helpful and useful when people are struggling with illness, right? Nowhere is the releasing and the grounding and the sense of acceptance and acknowledgement and welcoming more needed than when people are facing illness. <clears throat> illness is commonly experienced as a loss, right? It's a loss of predictability, a loss of stability, a loss of control over one's life, and often a loss of one's identity, right? Um, many people say that when they become seriously ill, it is like arriving in the middle of the night on a stormy sea right, with no lifeboat in sight. Right. And people at that point in their life desperately need to have a compass to help them navigate through this world. And those of us in this room know that there is no better compass than to come down into the body and to connect with you, all the complexity and the intricacy that is the that comprises the bodily felt sense, right? And that when we do that from that place, something fresh, something new arises. Right? We find a next step. We find where, what the direction healing would be for this moment. Right? So focusing allows us to have a sense of what a new direction would be at every moment during the illness process. Having an illness is enormously stressful. I mean, there's some question about whether having stress in one's life promotes illness. That's not so clear. What's perfectly clear is once you're ill, it's tremendously stressful, right? And what are all the stresses? Well, there are the stresses of the losses that I've just mentioned, right? It's very stressful to lose your, your bearings, to lose your sense of who you are. Um, it's also stressful um, to have the worrisome symptoms or to be dealing with chronic pain. It's very stressful to having to go to the doctor's appointments and having all those medical tests. It's stressful to have to make these decisions which feel impossible to make. And that's become even more, as, as complementary care comes in, we have even more paradigms to choose from and more, more complexity in the decision making. There are the financial worries. There's the anxiety about what this means in terms of facing death, right? So 
there is no time in life that is more stressful, it seems to me, than when you are diagnosed with a serious illness. And uh, so I have found that the focusing approach, the focusing attitude of acceptance, welcoming, acknowledging what's there, and the process itself can be enormously helpful. So let me tell you about a couple of clients who came to mind as I was preparing this. <clears throat> a woman that I see was diagnosed with ovarian cancer and came in the office panting with anxiety, <coughs> saying, they say I have to have surgery on Tuesday and I'm not ready. I'm just not ready. I, 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 feel, I feel nauseous inside when I think about it. So I invited her to take a few breaths, <coughs> to slow down, and to come into herself and to just greet that nausea that, that was there to be with it, and she said, well, actually, it's not like nausea. It's more really like being car sick. That's it. The car is going about 90 miles an hour. So I said, can we just sort of together be with that sense of car sickness and see what it needs? And she was very clear. She said, the car needs to slow down. I need to stop. I can't have the surgery on Tuesday. So I said, okay, let's see if we can honor that and ask, when would be the right time? And I was expecting she was going to say months, years, because she was in such a state. But she said, let's see, a week to 10 days, I'll be ready. I know that's what I need to collect myself. And so I asked her whether that fit with her belief system. Did she feel like it would be OK to postpone the surgery for a week to 10 days? Because, of course, that's important, too. And she said, I don't think it will make one whit of difference. It's only a week. I said, OK. And she then called her doctor, postponed the surgery, and sailed through it because she knew inside. She listened to that sense of nauseous, car sick feeling of moving too quickly that slowing down and waiting was the healing step for her to help herself prepare herself. So focusing can really address the level of stress as it's experienced in the body. Right? And it can also help us cope with fear that comes up, too. Another woman I see um, is dealing with <coughs> breast cancer, which has metastasized, and she has two young children who are four and six. And she's someone who, um, who really learned the clearing a space tool. Right? So sometimes you can use this in a subtle way of just slipping it in. The woman with the nausea didn't know anything about focusing. She just knew that she was listening at that moment to herself. Right? Um, but this other woman is someone who said, give me tools. And so I taught her the clearing a space tool, and that has been very useful. And each week she comes in and we clear a space. She takes out what it is that, even though she has a wonderful support system and a, a family <coughs> that's really there for her, most of what she shares in that clearing a space, she would, wouldn't want to share with them, right? It's, it's too hard. It affects them as well. So she comes in and she takes out each time what it is. She unravels the stress and the fear that live in her body and that accompany this illness. Right? And so she might, each week, she might take out a different, she, she'll take out all her fears. And so, and what, she com what comes there, of course, is a complete surprise to me. I could never predict what it is that she's sitting with, what's so fearful th in that week, right? And so one week I'm thinking of, she took out and she said, so there's fear that my son won't remember me. Right? And with that comes enormous tears, both of us. Uh, and then she said, but that's not all. And so we wait. And then comes the fear that her children won't be raised as Christians. Her husband is Jewish, and she's afraid that after she dies, because she's really very much uh, assuming that she has another few years and is um, at peace with that. Um, but it's, and then the fear comes that her children will think that the end of her life was full of sadness. And she said, actually, that's not true. In some ways, it's been the most joyful time because what's most essential to me in my life has come through, and I'm really living each day feeling such gratitude and that my kids won't remember me that way. So when I said, which one of these needs your attention most today, that was the one. So we took that in, and she sat with that. And um, 
very important to her that there was a legacy um, of her that included the joy. Mm -hmm. And so as we sat there and waited for a step to come that would help her to leave that legacy, she said, well, <coughs> I wish I liked to write um, because I really would like to write about this time in my life so that they would have it when they grew up. Right? So we sat there and she said, I don't like to write, but let's see what comes there. Ah, I have a friend who's taking a writing class now. Maybe I could tell my story to her and she would be my scribe and she would write this down. Right? And they did that. They began to meet weekly and um, the friend wrote beautiful stories, little vignettes about the different joys in her life. Right? And then from that she realized that she wanted to also leave mm -hmm. a legacy of describing her children, um, about what their births were like, what they were like when they were infants and children. And so she told that to her friend, and her friend took that down too. And now she has this wonderful book that she's creating that she can read. And it came through the body, through, through the body knowing what was needed next. And focusing can also be a wonderful tool to help people make behavioral changes, healthy behavioral changes that they want to make. So what comes to mind there is a man that I see who has MS. And he came into therapy and saying that the chief reason he was there was because he knew that it would be helpful to his body and to his illness and to his overall well-being if he could begin to do some things that were better for him. He was a heavy smoker, so he wanted to stop smoking. He knew he should take up some exercise to get more fit, and he wanted to do some yoga and to get some massage. And the first couple times he came in, his style was to describe to me all his symptoms in great detail, you know, and how they were. He would say the numbness in the left hand is a little, little worse, and, and the foot drop is, is, I would say, just slightly better this week. Uh, my fatigue is, is definitely worse. So he would go through all his symptoms, right? And then he would say, and I, I'm, I'm working on these um, areas of trying to make changes, but um, smoked a little less on Wednesday, but Thursday was bad again. And, right? So we'd get this kind of litany, he would tell a story. And so I said to him, um, I wonder if you could just take a moment and put all that aside and just bring your attention right into your body and see, see if you'd feel comfortable closing your eyes. And he did. And I said, so I'd like you just to sense inside and see what does it feel like to be you struggling with all of these symptoms and struggling with trying to make these changes that week after week are, are being hard to do. Right? And he sat for a moment, and then it came. He said, it feels relentless. It's so damn relentless. It doesn't stop. And with that finally came some tears. Right? When he came inside, he could feel from the inside what the struggle was like, rather than just narrating it for me on the outside. Right? So I said, let's just stay with this relentless man and see what it needs. Right? Just keep it company for a while. Right? Let's just accept it's there. It comes with the MS. Right? And so he sat with the relentless, and steps began to come, as they do, right, as we know. Right? So he said, the first thing that comes there is, he said, I need someone to touch me. Right? I need some touching. I need to get massaged every week. Right? This he was able to do because it wasn't coming from here. It wasn't an idea that he had on a list. Right? He could feel that would help the relentlessness of the MS symptoms. Right? So, and then he said, and I said, okay, let's just do that this week. Right? Don't, don't try and be ambitious, right? So he came back and he said, I had a massage and it made me feel like I wanted to stretch. So I'm going to do some yoga this coming week. I'm going to sign up for a yoga class. I'm not going to stay the whole time. I'm just going to stretch a little bit in the beginning, right? And so that's how he began to make these behavioral changes. Each time he would check inside and see what that relentless feeling or whatever came there freshly, what that needed. And I could not have said, first you should stop smoking, right, and then you should do the yoga, and then maybe you'll want to ride a bike, right? He, he knew what the next thing was. 
right? And very gradually, I watched him over a year's time make those changes. Right? But it came from this place, not from the lists. Right? What was very interesting was he said after a while, he said, you know, I've been coming here every other week. He was coming every two weeks. He said, to kind of hold my place here because I never knew what I would, when I would need you. He said, but now, he said, I realize I can just check inside and say, do I need to go see that, uh, that lady? <laughs> yeah, he said, I do. And then I pick up the phone, and I'll come to see you. Right? And isn't that really what we want, is for people to really check in and not to feel like we're just another thing on the calendar. Right? And so now with almost everyone I see, I say, tune inside and see when it's right to come back. Right? So that has to be, that's part of what also has to be fashioned so it fits people. So they don't feel like, and so someone says, I, I want to come less often, but I want to come for two hours, not an hour. So that's what we do, right? It, so we, I ask people, check inside. Right? Also, whenever someone does make a decision to do a, some kind of a health change, you know, to, to begin to exercise, to change their diet, before they leave, I say, can you just take a moment to check inside and see if that step that you said you wanted to make is really right for you and is really doable? Right? And then often it, cha it changes because what we say, right, you know, going to get up every morning and going to walk that three miles, right? When you actually ask them before they leave, check in and see if that's really the right step and one that you can really do. So just be in your body and imagine doing it and see, is that right for you? Often then they will amend it. <laughs>